Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and I'm just going to take a few moments to introduce the video that comes after this introduction. As you all might be aware, this semester I'm teaching online class classes, and we often have at least one or two live sessions every week. But of course, for privacy reasons, I cannot make those sessions available publicly. So what I've decided to do is to edit some of those online lectures as they are recorded and extract from them some useful materials that I can share publicly with a wider audience. So with that hope, I will be making some of these class sessions available to you over the semester. Uh, I hope this is useful to you. I hope you can use these in your classes. And uh, I hope you can also use them personally for your own education. Any questions in the comment section if you would like me to add something else or, you know, uh, enhance the level of engagement with you through these recorded versions. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much. And let's watch one of the lectures, the redacted version, and see how it goes. Thank you. And here it is. So we can start our conversation. Uh, I'm not going to cover the whole of chapter two. I'll probably cover till page 64. And my hope is that as I introduce you to, you know, different ideas that she's invoking and talking about, then of course you all are reading carefully. And part of this reading isn't just to master what she's saying. Obviously, we do that. But also, it's a good example of how to craft an argument that is doing something innovative, but also is attendant to the nuances of that argument. That's what we all must learn as scholars, because so many times we, we get so centered on this is what I want to say and this is how I'm going to say it, but we don't take into account what could be the counter challenges to our own argument or what kind of vocabularies to, to uh, employ. Uh, so the, keep that in mind. So, so as we discuss chapter one, you know, basically in chapter one, she lays out what are her problems with so-called Western feminism, and she discusses it under different registers. Now, in this chapter, she tells us from the very start what, if you look at the Audrey Lord uh, quote there, but what she's trying to, if you just look at the title, Cartographies of Struggle, Third World Women and the Politics of Feminism, right? So the term cartography is a loaded term in post-colonial studies and elsewhere as well, because it is about map making, right? And so much of what happens under colonialism or was accomplished by the colonizers was by mapping the world right, and by mapping the world in a way, if you look at how the first world maps were created, there is a technical term for it, which of course I'm going to forget, but the method that they used, what it meant was that the mapping would center Europe, but as you looked at the world map compared to Europe, all the other parts of the world would seem smaller, okay? And, and so the visually, it emphasized the whole idea of Europe itself and centered it and then placed everything else on the periphery. If you look at the world maps that we see in United States, since they have to center United States in the world map, you will see that there are some idiosyncrasies in that world map. So, so cartography is not just recording the world and mapping it, it also has a politics behind it. So when she's talking about cartographies of struggle, there is two kind of mapping that she's talking about. One of course is the literal mapping, what constitutes the third word, that's the question she must answer. 
And how is she lumping these feminists from different parts of the world together? And then what is the conceptual cartography? What, what are the concepts that allow her to map, you know, the history of non-Western feminism? Uh, so, okay, Aisha's internet is not working. So we'll have to see if she can rejoin it. But if you look at this chapter, she starts with two sets of questions, right? What she's saying is if, first of all, what she's, she tells us how is she employing the term third world, right? On page 44. And he, she says, I use the term third world to designate geographical location and socio-historical conjunct conjunctures. It thus incorporates so-called minority people or people of the color in United States. So that's one strategic move that she's making. Since, since she's gonna talk about feminism, of course, and third world feminism, she's creating this broader coalition. She's not just giving us a geographic um, delineation of her feed. She's also incorporating within her discussion in solidarity, the African-American, the Latin American, the Chicano and Chicana feminists, all of their debates and struggles, she's making them part of her cartography. So that's a really strategic move, right? And then she gives us her reasons. She explains how they are included and why they constitute themselves also as a third world because their struggles are the same struggles or similar struggles as the third world women. But then she goes on to tell us, charting the ground for an analysis of third world women and the politics of feminism is no easy task. First, there are the questions of definition, right? If you were to go and tell someone I do third world feminism, the first would be, the, how do you define it? Right? And these are the questions she's posing here. Who, what is the third world? Do third world women make up any kind of a constituency? On what basis? Can we assume that third world women's political struggles are necessarily feminist? How do we, they define feminism? And second, there are the questions about context. So first are of course the questions about what is third world feminism? How do they define it? Do they define it? How is it different? So these are the questions uh, that define the very term itself and you have to handle those. The contextual questions are, you know, how do questions of gender, race and nation in, intersect in determining feminism in the third world? Who produces knowledge about colonized peoples and from what space? What are the politics of the production of this particular knowledge? And then questions of definition and context. So these are the two layered questions that she must address in order to articulate her point. And that is what she is doing in this chapter under different registers. The question of what constitutes third world feminism and two, under what context can it be discussed? How can it be discussed? Now remember, as I mentioned, this is a groundbreaking work when it was published because it's a feminist work by a scholar originally from India, but whose entire experience and training was in the United States and who was engaged in feminism in the context of United States. So what she's saying in the next part, I write this cartography from my own particular political, historical and intellectual location as a third world feminist trained in the United States, interested in questions of culture, knowledge production and activism in an international context, right? So this is something that you will notice a lot of feminist, uh, a lot of those of us who are considered peri periphery scholars, scholars who don't do work in established subfields, uh, we always place ourselves, right? And it's, it's kind of a tendency or habit 
that we locate ourselves before we argue our point. Okay. And there are, there are strategic re reasons behind it because when you locate yourself, then you're clearly pointing to anyone who's reading it that, hey, if you're going to extrapolate from one of what I have written, uh, please go to page 34 and see that I declared this is the positionality I am taking. It could be provisional. But we train ourselves to do that. And I wasn't aware of it until one of my colleagues talked to me because he runs a journal, a very traditional journal. And he asked me, he's like, I'm noticing that young people, when they submit their essays, they spent a couple of paragraphs or two in justifying their right to speak, right? Uh, especially if they are writing about minority characters and everything else. And he's like, why do they do that? They don't need to do that. And I had to point to him that, no, I mean, if you have a so-called privileged location within the metropolitan culture, you are going against the grain of people already telling you, you know, don't tell us how to do things. So you have to create a bridge. You have to declare whether you're writing in solidarity or whether you're writing experientially or whether you're writing because you feel strongly about this subject and would like to add your voice. Now you all are already aware of it because I mean, think of it, those of you who are men you already know in your scholarly work never to assume that you can tell women how to do things, right? And even you can't even appropriate your their debates. And if you do so, you will do it in a way where it becomes very obvious, even though it could be subtle in your writing, that you're writing in solidarity. But you'll be very attentive to not coming across as someone who's patronizing or, or someone who is appropriating someone else's territory, right? But older scholars have never had to confront these issues, right? Especially male scholars. So that's the question of she positioning herself. Um, then she also tells us that, you know, she's very careful in explaining to us that she is not going to generalize third world feminism, right? because that is one of her arguments that the debates about third world feminism, first of all, need to happen. And two, they should not be generalized as, first of all, as one monolithic group existing somewhere in the place called third world, or they should not just be reduced to the tools developed by Western feminism. So, so she's very careful in pointing that out. In this chapter, then, I attempt to formulate an initial and necessarily non-comprehensive response to the above questions. We already talked about the questions. Thus, this chapter offers a very partial conceptual map. It touches upon certain contexts and foregrounds, particular definitions and strategies, right? So in the previous chapter, as we discussed it and talked about it, she gave us her analysis of what she sees is wrong with the so-called Western feminism and its assumptions about the third world. In this chapter, then, she's going to introduce us to her own conceptual framework. What is she going to use to now study third world feminism differently from the people that she has previously challenged and indicted? in that she's already made it clear before this point in the chapter that she's defining third world loosely and includes in it the struggles and the fights of the minority women's populations in the developing world itself, in the developed world itself in United States and Britain, and that she has no problem finding them as part of what she constitutes as third world. Okay. So first she goes about the question of what, what is lacking and what is lacking is the, the very historiography of non-Western third world feminism. So what she's saying is that there is like, if you look at 
Western feminism, for example, or American feminism. You can pick up any books that would tell you here is first wave feminism. These were the major figures. Here's the second wave feminism. These are the major figures. This is what they wrote. You can get a conceptual historiography, but nothing of that sort exists. So part of this project is creating that historiography, right? Or that history. So question of feminist historiography, reading against the grain of a number of intersecting progressive discourses. So her project is reading against the liberal middle-class Western feminist discourses, then the questions of race and gender. But then she's saying that I'm not going to center gender alone. Okay, I'm also going to bring in class. I'm also going to bring in race. I'm also going to bring in region. So then she goes is third world women as an analytical and political category. Thus, I want to recognize and analytically explore the links among the histories and struggles of third world women against what? Against racism, sexism, colonialism, imperialism, and monopoly capital. Right, these are the things. I'm suggesting then an imagined community of third world oppositional struggles. Okay, so the concept of the imagined communities as Aisha so aptly pointed out comes from Benedict Anderson. Actually, I just edited um, one of my webinars on it and uploaded it to YouTube. It should be live today, but so the concept of the imagined communities comes from Benedict Anderson from his 1983 book called Imagined Communities. The concept was offered against other theories of nationalism, for example, the organismic and mechanistic theories of nationalism. Uh, now, mechanistic theory of nationalism is pretty simple. You think of a nation as a machine, it has different parts, it has a head, it has a body, and you the, its lineage, its, its philosophical lineages from Hobbes, John Locke, and others. And then the organistic view of the nation comes from German ideologists like Herder and Fichte and all these other writers who think of a nation as a living organism, right? So both have their own ramifications. What Benedict Anderson suggested that, that a nation or a nation state ought to have few attributes, right? It must be sovereign, it must have a territory, right? And, and it must be limited because of that territory. And within that, the question that he's trying to answer is why is it that if in a far flung corner of the world, you know, this is not what he example that he uses. Uh, three hostages are taken and one of them is American. Why is it that you sitting in North Texas feel sad or worried for that person, right? What, from where does come that feeling even though if you don't know this person, you probably will never meet this person where does that feeling come from, right? And his idea is that nations, modern nations emerge as imagined communities after print capitalism is established. And so he gives us two examples, right? Of the broadsheet, the newspaper as it is developed and of the novel, right? And so, when he gives you the example of a newspaper, what he says is that a newspaper will have different news on the front page, some national, some international, but it's the ritual of opening a newspaper, New York Times, that I do here in the privacy of my room, you do over there, everyone else does over there. It's that ritual of interacting with the print form that enables you to see the world, but within that it particularizes your experience as an American for you, right? Similarly, in the pages of a novel, the novel doesn't create nationalism, but you read in the process of reading it, you read yourself in it. 
there are people you feel more affinity towards. Now, one of the best examples of that could be uh, American realist writing. And I mean, if you've read your, uh, what is it? Isabel Archer, which novel is it? Come on, creative writers. Uh, the American, have you read that novel? But, but the idea is that, okay, so um, Isabel Archer is this American character, you know, from United States, marries a European, right? And then she is this quintessentially represented this pure or uncomplicated American surrounded by these lecherous European men, these decade, decadent European culture. And in that, in that novel, then this idea of America being unsullied and not contaminated by the old Europe emerges as, as the idea of America. Now, if you look at American historiography, that idea is offered to us as natural, right? But it was constructed by historians, right? I mean, if you read uh, Frederick Turner's famous essay, The Closing of the American Frontier, uh, it would tell you that in the process of their march from east to the west, as the Americans moved into the west, in the process of that movement, they also developed a quintessentially American rigorous or vigorous identity. All of that idea is creating through a recording of what constitutes being American, right? What we associate with it. So that's roughly imagined communities, right? So she's picking that, the core of that concept, but she's not saying I'm gonna rely on imagined communities. She's saying, let's find another core concept coupled with community. So she comes up with communities of resistance. That's the vocabulary that she's using that I am going to read third world feminism where these communities of resistance to capitalism, to patriarchy, to the current monopoly capital, all of the things that she has already mentioned, that larger concept will allow her to study these disparate groups because what constitutes them as an imagined, imagined community is that they are a community of resistance. So that's why she goes to Benedict Anderson and then comes to communities of resistance. Communities of resistance, which refers to the broad-based opposition of refugee, migrant, and black groups in Britain to the idea of a common nation. So that's she incorporating the local debates within more, more local fights. Communities of resistance, like, like imagined communities, is a political definition, not an essentialist one. It is not based on any ahistorical notion of the inherent resistance and resilience of third world people. Okay, So as I told you, she, she's a really careful scholar. Okay, So the moment you start thinking, oh, you know, come on, she's essentializing resistance, the very next sentence she tells you, no, 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 no. Communities of resistance as political communities and not because they are black or brown or, or female, no. What they do politically is what constitutes the community. And then she applies that to third world. So there, there is a solidarity that she's developing conceptually, but also politically with the women groups struggling in the metropolitan culture as well against race, against poverty, against you know injustice. And she is taking their fights, their vocabularies, and then also bringing them together with the third word. This is the kind of scholarship you know, that lives. I mean, that's why Chandra Mohanty is so big because she doesn't rely on these very simple binaristic views of this or that. So, yeah. okay. Tommy says reading habits have changed a lot since imagined communities. Globalization also leads to people reading books from other nations. Yet nationalism in the U.S. seems stronger than ever. Very good point. Uh, and I mean, I could go into that in another lecture, but 
that the rise of the chauvinistic nationalism is also intimately connected to neoliberal capital and that it produces huge swaths of population who are left outside of the so-called promise of upward mobility. And, and there is a term for it, we call it the precariat, right? And then when those groups dis, gets disenfranchised, but also develop these regional and cultural grievances, and then those grievances are politically mobilized to point to them that it's people who opened the economy are responsible for it and their jobs are being taken over by this, this, and this. And that becomes a perfect recipe for this kind of chauvinistic nationalism. Uh, I mean, on a side note, have you ever noticed that the people who tend to be most nationalistic and put their caps on and everything else are also the very people who, when they get their first check, where do they go? To Walmart to pay their money to China and all the other people that they are blaming, right? But those contradictions kind of, um, they don't see that, right? But how many of these people who are nationalistic and all American would rather drive 10 miles to go out to a locally owned store to buy organic vegetables that are produced by local farmers? I mean, it's the snowflakes who do that like the people who are unpatriotic. So, so th there are those contradictions too in these group identities. I sometimes point it out to people I know and then they get mad at me. Uh, Jonathan, nationalism also tends to be a reaction to increasing globalization. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, and you saw that in, uh, in of course the Brexit debate. Now, what I'm, what, we must be careful to point out that that feeling is always there objectively, feeling like, okay, we are powerless or our government is not doing enough for it. But those objective differences remain until someone comes and mobilizes them politically, right? So those resentments against immigrants are there, those resentments against other Europeans are there. But it takes an act of politics to mobilize that as a constituency to then re-articulate a more chauvinistic brand of nationalism, right? Uh, but good points. Okay, so then uh, towards the end of page 47, she gives us a rough idea of third world, right? Geographically, the nation states of Latin America, America the Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia, China, South Africa, and Oceania. Oceania constitute the parameters of non-European third world. In addition, Black, Latino, Asian, and indigenous peoples in the United States, Europe, and Australia, some of whom have historic links with the geographically defined third world, also refer to themselves as third world peoples. With such a broad canvas, racial, sexual, national, economic, and cultural borders are difficult to demarcate, shaped politically as they are in individual and collective practices. But this is what then for her comes out to be what she thinks constitutes the third world in terms of physical cartography, but also conceptual and political. And then, she goes on to discuss the first part of her discussion in this chapter, and that is the third world woman as a social category, right? Um, how are they read traditionally? And then how would she would like to treat them? And so, So how, how have others studied third world women as a category? And she says, for instance, compare the analysis of fertility offered by Momsum, and she's referring to two works, right? Um, 
by analyzing the politics of family planning in the context of the Brazilian women's movement and examining the way poor women build collective knowledge about sex education and sexuality, Barroso and Borussini link state policy and social movements with the politics of everyday life, thus presenting us with a dynamic historical specific view of the struggle of Brazilian women. Right? And I address some of these questions in more detail. For the present, suffice it to, to say that our definitions, descriptions, and interpretations of third world women's engagement with feminism must necessarily be simultaneously historically specific and dynamic, not frozen in time in the form of a spectacle. So if you are going to talk about third world women as a category of analysis, which we talked about in the first chapter, it has to be within the specificity of the region where they come from, but also within the specificity of not their victimhood, but their struggles, local. How have they come together? How do they fight against it, right? And then what's, what role does the state play in it? What role do other institutions play in it? That is crucial to study because then you will find out that so much of what they are up against is based in the politics of the nation state itself, but also beyond that, the impact of global capitalism and how it incorporates the female bodies within its project. But then she gives us, um, so answer to this question, you know, how do third world women that he's already, she's already told us loosely who they are, how do they become a constituency, right? And she said, first, just as Western women or white women, women cannot be defined as coherent interest groups, third world women also do not constitute any automatic unity group. We can't just lump them together. Alliances and divisions of class, religion, sexuality, and history, for instance, are necessarily internal to each of the, each of the above groups. Second, Ideological differences in understanding of the social mediate any assumption of a national bond between women. Three, finally, defining third world women in terms of their problems or their achievements in relation to an imagined free white liberal democracy effectively removes them from history, freezing them in time and space. So these are the three ways in which we cannot discuss third world women, how should we discuss them? And that's the next paragraph. In terms of oppositional politics, right? What kind of politics do they mobilize, right? How do they build solidarities, right? So the idea is you don't take the third world women as a pre-constituted victim of patriarchy, victim of capitalism or this angelic figure who has all the answers, but rather see them as fully realized autonomous political beings engaged in a struggle. And when you start mapping the struggle itself, that is when you create a constituency. That is when you create specific identities of collective struggles, individual struggles, but you can then bring them together as a constituency, okay? So the common context then, what she's then defining is struggle itself, okay? I'm gonna stop here because I, I had said I'll go only up to this page. Did I say I'll only go up to this page? Okay. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about what she talks after this about, she gives us an example, several examples. But one is from Chaudhry's work, um, is how, and we briefly talked about it, how is it that the third world women during the colonial phase get reinscribed into more stringent gender norms, right? More stringent role within the social sphere. And part of it is 
through the codification of the colonial law. Okay. And she gives you the example of these women from Haryana, which were part of Punjab province of India then, and it's now a separate province. And these Punjabi women actually from land holding families who traditionally had the inheritance rights and were encouraged to remarry, which was pretty rare in traditional Hinduism because you know, there is a whole mythology of uh, the widows not marrying, right? And so based on that, the way the British reinscribe them in a more traditional role in the society is by playing with the local hierarchies. And how do they do that? Now, look, if you are a British administrator in India, your interest is to keep a stable political atmosphere so that you can extract revenue and extract resources. In order to do that, the way the British create their hegemony in rural parts of India is by making certain cultural policies. And what were those cultural policies? Is by telling all the land holding classes, we are not here to disrupt anything that you've been doing over here. We will make sure that your regional laws, your tribal laws are respected, right? All we want from you is loyalty in return and you know your revenues. So what that does is it leaves the development of women's rights within that culture, within the hands of the patriarchal order, right? Without any intervention of any new ideas coming in. And so what was considered appropriate in these tribal cultures was because land was what you valued the most. And since women could inherit land, then women who were widowed, they were sometimes forced to marry within the family so that the land could stay within the family. Now, the role the colonial government plays in it is that even when these women go to the court to sue, to retain their own right to the land, the courts would rule in favor of the tribal elders, in favor of the men, because their idea wasn't to liberate women. They just wanted, you know, a less troublesome peasantry governed by the landholders. So in the process then, what these women have to fight is not just the the men in their own tribe, they also have to fight the colonial law, right? Then there is also, she gives us an example of Partha Chatterjee, this creation of the middle class woman, right? In the imagination of native Indians in so many parts. She mentions the Bahadur Lok, the middle class. So the middle class female subjectivity under colonialism is created in um, relation to the Victorian concept of womanhood, right? But increasingly, women who are presented on stage in dramas and stories are women who follow their own tradition, don't go out, stay at home, right? So the kind of femalehood or female identity that is perpetuated under colonialism is women belong inside the home and men are the ones who go outside. All the laws that are instituted under colonialism deal with men, right? Questions of their mobility in the culture. And so that's the debate that she's giving us in, in this uh, discussion. And, and the role of the state, because then, uh, the next concept that she's mobilizing it, what she calls the relations of power. Okay. Now, and under that, she discusses that. So by relations of power, what she means is, you know, how is a hegemonic order created? What are the discourses that underwrite it? What are the politics behind it? Right? And what, what kind of laws 
are produced and, and used. And it is that relations of power within which women have to struggle, have to define their politics. So in order to study their responses, we have to know what relations of power exist in a given place, in a given system against which they struggle. And only then we will then learn what kind of feminism can be mobilized against that? What kind of solidarities? Okay, I'm going to stop here. We'll continue our conversation, of course, on Thursday. And But I would be happy to talk about anything else that you want to talk about um, until page 52, I think 53. Uh, I mean, relations of rule, right? Relations of rule. Obviously, I cannot discuss every main concept here. All right, questions? So while you're coming up with questions, here is what we must keep in mind. How are we going to mobilize this knowledge as we start reading the novels, right? That's the important part. The purpose of this reading is to give ourselves, you know, a nuanced understanding of the politics of feminism in the third world, in the developing world, because that's where our novels are coming from that we will be reading. And you will see that, um, you know, this is a slightly dated book. Those of you have, who have gone through the educational, uh, your degrees in the last four or five years uh, would already know that most of you already think like that. Uh, you, you don't look at a sign and see, feel like it carries the entire meanings. Culturally, you know, unless you belong to that constituency that absolutely wants to deny the march of history and everything else. By and large, most of you, if, we, if you have lived kind of a reflective life in a diverse culture, have already internalized that the worst thing that you can do is to make a statement by simply seeing a sign or an action, because we also always already have trained ourselves to see pretty much every sign within its context. So, I mean, any one of you, there is no way any guy sitting here, unless he wants to be single for the rest of his life, will ever talk to a woman and say, you know, women are like this. No, none of us will make those kind of essentialist claims because we will immediately be told, hey, you know, you're being silly and this is a very sexist statement. So already in our minds, we, and you don't even realize how complex your own mode of thinking is. Think of it this way. We are attentive to not just what we want to say. We are attentive to who we are speaking to. What is their location within a given moment where we are talking to them, but also within a given world in which we live. So we'll be attentive to their race, their ethnicity, their gender, their sexuality, their politics, right? And the only people who insist on not incorporating those subtleties in their everyday interactions are now going to be the Patriot Party because their biggest fight is I should be able to say whatever I want. And you're like, uh, no, right? So what she's suggesting over here, as you pointed out, relations of power, we already do that, right? When we see someone on the street, right? Uh, panhandling or sitting on the street asking for money, chances are we never really assume if we are decent human beings that this person is a failure or this person is a bum. All we think is, hey, maybe he's a veteran. Maybe he has had hard time. Maybe he has drinking problem. None of that makes that person an evil person or a bad person because of the way they look, right? Or, 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 or their station in life. So most of the times our thought processes, your thought processes are already sophisticated enough that you read the sign within its historical, 
within its cultural and political context. And, and we have reached a, a level in our cultural development here in the United States, at least, where the moment someone doesn't do that, the moment someone doesn't look at a broader context or a more complex context, it becomes immediately evident to us, right? Tell me if I'm wrong, right? But yes, absolutely, like when you read Joys of Motherhood, you know, here is no ego, one, a very strong woman who struggles all her life. We can read it as her individual struggle, but we can also read it as, okay, what part of her struggles are perpetuated by the very system in which she exists? where there is no safety net, there is, there is no one to turn to, she doesn't even have many rights and she's living in the capital city under colonialism. All of these things then play a role in our understanding of these characters, right? Good point. All right, uh, there was another thing that, remember she also is telling us that what she's mobilizing and retrieving is a critique of second wave feminism. So anyone wants to give us some ideas about second wave feminism? Yeah. So the transition was the first wave feminism, the biggest fight was the right to enter the public sphere and the right to having the vote. And then when second world war happens, all these women, you know, they of necessity, become part of the national project. They're working in the factories and everything else. But as soon as the war ends, like in United States, the, the way of life that is privileged is this middle-class white family structure in which women go and become the homemakers and they are responsible for that. Everything is catered towards men working and doing all that and women domesticated. So it was a reaction to that, right? So then some of the fights that they are fighting are the fights about reproductive rights, the fights about equality in the household, but eventually it also becomes the, the, the rights of women in the private sphere, right? So the question of marital rape, right? The question of battered women. And then uh, the good things that came out of it was a lot of legislation, right? But also the, the development of women's shelters or battered women's shelters, all of that comes during the second wave feminist phase. Uh, also, eventually, uh, the, the fight over abortion is launched by that. But the biggest criticism of them was that they were imagining all women as white middle class women. There was no room in it for minority women, for women who were not middle class or who were rural. So there are different challenges that are posed to it. The first major challenge comes from the standpoint theories, African-American scholars, right? African-American feminists who basically turn around and say, you know, you can't speak of my experience unless you have experienced the world in my body because only then you can experience what being a black woman is, right? That is what we call the standpoint views of gender and gender identity and, and sexuality. And then third wave feminism kind of starts with vive la de France, but then moves into a more inclusive, but also a more theoretical kind of feminism, right? Uh, if you read, really want to read a good book that gives you a good history of these debates, uh, my mentor Robin Goodman's book, uh, World Class Women, gives you a good history of these debates and these fights. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in the comments as well. Class. And she also then advocates like quite a few other feminists for a return to first wave feminism, for the fight about the public sphere, right? And not necessarily fighting in that capitalistic mode of uh, having the autonomy inside the home and counting our labor at home as labor in the office and all that. So there are quite a few feminists who 
would argue that we need to go back to the fights about the public sphere. What are our rights in there? What are our political rights? And so then the third world feminism that she's talking about also then challenges those monolithic assumptions. Uh, for example, they, she gives you an example that while it might have been a big fight, the right to abortion for the second wave feminists, right? It wasn't the same fight for, for black women in the rural United States or South Africa and elsewhere because they were rather fighting for the right to have children because they were they had to go undergo forced sterilizations right through state policies right they were um, through eugenics so so to assume that their fight was the same fight as white middle class women you know there was a problem with that right uh, there is also of course she constantly creates there is a critique of essentialized gendered identity, right? What she's saying is that that should not be the only register under which we should come together and fight, okay? And what that creates a room is, is that, that men can also be part of the struggle and have to be part of the struggle. Okay, I'm not going to go into that, but I think on Thursday, um, we'll start with, I mean, the, there are a lot to unpack, like the bureaucratic masculinity in the colonial sense that she talks about is how was the figure of the European man constructed through law, through socialization, how did they represent themselves, right? And uh, how did they treat the native women? They were having sexual relationships with them, but they could not acknowledge it, right? But that masculinity model then also becomes the model for in, within the public sphere for the native men, right? Because if they, if they adopt that, then they become those Victorian men, right? If you're gonna become a gentleman, and you're gonna be as like your masters, then chances are you'll also inhabit their view of women in your own family, but in your own culture. So all of those things, what kind of masculinity develops under colonialism, performative masculinity and what impact it has on the rights of women. Okay, I'm running out of breath here, so. Any other questions or concerns? Obviously you guys are reading the book, right? I'm hoping because no amount of lecturing can actually teach you anything. So, I mean, you know, read it carefully and we, we continue talking about it. And then, you know, we go to the fun stuff. We write stories, we read stories and talk about them. So this concludes this edited version of a live lecture. I'll be back with more and please keep an eye out for these and I hope these are useful to you. Thank you so much and as always, peace and love.